I will just briefly introduce the meeting. Thanking you, first of all, for joining us for this webinar. It's a pleasure to see that the performance has led us to ask questions and that you have accepted our invitation to discuss and dialogue. As you might know, Agnes of God was conceived from the start to be a project which goes beyond the theatrical production. Its aim was always to serve as a vehicle to instigate questions and reflection. Today, we will be focusing on the ethical issues which the, the play brings to the fore. Was Mother Superior doing the right thing in keeping Agnes protected? Was Agnes more responsible to the murder of the baby? What about Dr. Livingston? Was she right in persisting to dig deeper into Agnes's life? These are just some of the questions which we will try to explore today. With us, we have Carlo Calleia, a Catholic priest who has a doctorate in moral theology, and Gail De Bono, who is a psychologist and a member of the Malta Humanist Association. The plan is very simple. We won't make it too formal. We'll start with two interventions of 15 minutes each from our guests, and then we'll open the floor for reactions and further discussions. Okay, so um, unless there are questions, we, I can pass on the word to Carlo. Okay, so hello everybody, good evening. Uh, thank you first of all to Christian Colombo and to Tyron Grima for organizing this really beautiful event, this great initiative. I'm honored to be taking part in it um, and to share my reflections on this play, Agnes of God. And uh, I'd like to start precisely with this, how much I'm really um, appreciating this moment of coming together to discuss and to dialogue together as believers and non-believers. As I've said also in another um, article I wrote on precisely on, on, this, uh, on, the, on this initiative, I had mentioned how this is not the first opportunity. Obviously, there have been many others who have done so before. So most famously, there was, for example, the Bishop, the Archbishop of Milan, Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini, um, who had published a book together with Umberto Eco, in which Umberto Eco, who describes himself as a non-believer, and they had published their correspondence, their letters to each other where they reflected on what it means, what does the truth mean? What does it mean to live in a society today? And what place does God have? Or what place does belief have in today's society? And I remember while I was reading this book, I was really impressed by the, the, how they carried forward their conversation with a sense of humility, with a sense of um, great respect towards each other. So it was something that I found really, really inspiring. Then there were others, for example, um, another cardinal, uh, Gianfranco Ravasi, who had uh, started the famous Courtyard of the Gentiles, where um, he, it was an initiative which I think had started also in Malta, where they would, where they would bring together believers and non-believers and discuss together. The idea was to have a, a, a kind of, what would you call it, like cross fertilization or um, cross pollination so that believers learn from non-believers while non-believers learn from believers. And in a way I see that this in some way goes on. For example, um, Dr. And the, the, the mother superior, who mother superior would, we would expect is the one who believes, the believer. But at the same time, even she has her moments of doubt. And on the other hand, also um, the psychiatrist, Dr. Livingston, whom we would expect to be the non-believer and who states, she says, no, I, I've stopped believing in God. I'm a lapsed Christian or Catholic. But then, in fact, you start seeing that somehow she still believes because you can see that she still, perhaps if she does not articulate, articulate clearly her faith in God, at least you can say that at least she still believes that things can turn for the better. She has like, uh, she still has like a speck of faith in her, a speck of hope, hope which you can define as one of the hallmarks of a Christian. 
Then there was also, can, the, the list continues going on. For example, um, Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became Pope Benedict, that famous uh, dialogue with Jürgen Habermas, the German uh, philosopher who had described himself as tone deaf to, tone deaf to faith, tone deaf, tone deaf to faith. But at the same time, he was able to continue a conversation and to say, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses of living in a society where there is religion? And the same thing, obviously, in, the, in, in an opposite way, therefore focusing on the effects of a healthy kind of secularization um, is what um, Pope Benedict had very often and frequently spoken about. And then most recently, um, Pope Francis in his discussions with an old friend of his, Eugenio Scalfari, the editor of La Repubblica. There again, there, was, uh, there were some letters that they had sent each other, the correspondence was published, and you can see how sometimes even Pope, Pope Francis, in fact, sometimes was criticized by certain um, news outlets, uh, certain Christian news outlets, because they would say that he is being too liberal or too this or too that. But actually, as I said also in my article, I think he was simply staring into the eyes of mystery together with Eugenio. He isn't anymore the pontifex, the pope there, but he is just Jorge, thinking about what he believes in, ultimately what he thinks, that um, trying to articulate his faith as a simple man. Once again, I'm really enjoying this, this initiative. Um, I can go on to, to speak about the, 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 the moral issues related to this play, in particular about moral responsibility. Can we speak about moral responsibility here when we have a person, Agnes the novice, who it seems had um, a background of abuse, of child abuse, and therefore can we, can we hold her responsible for her actions? Uh, I think that just to mention a conclusion here and perhaps we can go a bit more into the, into discussing it a bit further, perhaps you can say that, um, I think it is more the responsibility of the people around her. There we have a, a woman who was weak, who was very weak. A woman who, uh, because what she has passed through, might not have the moral agency that we would expect out of another person who has not passed through such experiences. And therefore, it isn't simply a question of saying, no, she is not guilty. No, she did not commit a sin. But it goes much more than that. Who, who is responsible for this? Am I responsible for anything, uh, for the wrongdoings of others as well? It is not fair on, on a particular individual only. We also have to look at the rest of society as well, uh, since we live in a network of relationships. Uh, we speak of um, structures of sin, right? Um, it isn't only an individual who commits a grave evil, but usually there is also a whole network um, of persons who, leads, who lead a person to commit something that is evil. Um, I think I can stop here for now, uh, and then we can develop. I mean, I have much more to say, <laughs> but we can perhaps discuss this as we go along, as the as the conversation develops. So thank you, Carlo. Um, just a small point. I think at one point you were touching the microphone with your hands yes, could on be. the could be okay I'm, that's I'm just to tell you to that. okay thank you um i think that's it's a very interesting point this, this one that you raised that there is not a single person who is responsible frequently but it's like the community around that person who is responsible so yes that i i think warrants a lot of further um discussion okay so i pass the word now to gail Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking both you, Christian and Tyrone as well for um, inviting me and involving me in this extremely interesting project. Um, it's, I, I've really enjoyed being a part of it from the very start. And of course, the performance I'm pretty sure you've heard from everybody who was there was exceptional. So thank you. Um, Carlo, I, I'm really glad you touched on this point. Um, first of all, I want to say that I, I, I like the fact that you said 
these um, debates are very important because, and that they're based on respect. Had we not had respect for one another, these, these debates would not be possible. Um, we see on a day-to-day -day basis that debates are a flop on national television, for example, when people disrespect each other totally, either by saying the wrong thing or talking out of place or so on. So I want to thank you for, for agreeing to take part. Um, I am, uh, while I was watching, naturally the psychologist in me, while I was watching the, the, the play live, I was thinking, mm, this, is, this is what she's going to ask next. This is what, I, I um, specifically on, purposely refrained from reading the script beforehand, okay, even though I had access to it. Um, um, so you're right um, regarding um, the actions of Agnes. They are not just the actions of Agnes. They are, um, the act they are the result of the circumstances by which Agnes arrived at the point of being in a monastery, living as a nun, and giving birth and killing that child. Um, from a psychological perspective, there was the, 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 the sexual and psychological abuse as a child that she suffered. And it is made ten much worse by the fact that it came from a primary carer, a person who was supposed to protect her from such um, eventualities. This was also in together with, and then also followed by alienation from the world. So we are told that Agnes is so innocent, she's never even been outside, she doesn't know anything about the outside world. And rather than then we see Agnes growing into the outside world and attempting to adapt, she was put in a convent. So she was completely alienated from the outside world from the get-go. And you can see her innocence. You can see that there are many things. It came out really well. It was portrayed very well, actually, by the actors. But you can see that there are many things that Agnes was, is not privy to, many things which are obvious to people who, of a certain age um, and certain experience in the world, are not. After that, she naturally developed the shame and the guilt and the distorted sense of self that one develops from abuse, especially when the abuse, I, I will say it again, comes from somebody who is meant to install self-esteem in a person, such as a mother. It is from your parents, it's from the adults who care for you that you gain your self-esteem, you garner your self-esteem as you are growing up. So if your mother is, is saying you are useless and um, I can't remember the terminology exactly that she used in, in during the play, but I remember one of them was, you are useless, you are nobody, you are nothing. Um, so through that, she developed an, inter an internal sense of shame and guilt and a distorted, self of who, a distorted sense of who she really is. She had no tools of coping. She was never taught how to cope with anything in life. She was sheltered with the exception of being given religion, which can be a very important, very good tool to use to cope. But in her case, she was only given that. She was given nothing else. And then, as a result of that, she saw everything through the eyes of religion because she knew no other way of seeing things. So in this case, as we see by the end of the play, religion was not the answer, didn't factor in, into it, with the exception of the, the location where the rape happened. Um, in, in our sense, in our sense, Tauna, tauna sense, Ligirata Mextes, such bit tight, there was a man in a field and, and, and so on. Although in, in the original, I, I read later, it was when she was she went away some nine months earlier. Um, um, but we, we were, there was a lot of, is this a religious issue? Is this not? Is this something? Um, transcendental that happened to Agnes, whereas naturally the psychologist and the atheist in me was like, no, there's a woman who gave birth and there's a dead baby and the woman is claiming she does not remember giving birth. Now, if that is a primary um, Uh, Gail, can you hear us?
Carlo, you, yes. you can continue building okay. on this point, please. Sure. Uh, I think what, um, so um, Gail started, I think, bringing up a very important point, the place of religion in guilt and shame, and perhaps also the, the place of mystical experiences. So in fact, one of the questions that I was asked um, when I was asked to participate in this was, um, what, what responsibility do we have when a person has mystical experiences, is going through mystical experiences? Um, it is a bit hard to, I, 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 I think that sometimes it is hard to make a clear distinction between what is a mystical experience and what is um, due to a, a psychiatric issue. This is something that obviously Gail can tell us a bit more about. However, at the same time, we cannot say that there isn't a, a, a distinction at all. Uh, first of all, um, we can say, we can almost quote also the Bible where it says, you will recognize them. I was referring obviously to other cases, to another situation, but Jesus says, you will recognize them. You will recognize who is my disciple from their fruits. In other words, from the kind of fruits that they produce. So if you, if you have a case where evil is being done, it cannot easily be attributed to mystical experiences. Uh, so that, can, that is something that can be ruled out immediately, where you have a case of a person who is committing something that is overtly evil, um, and then claiming that, it, that he or she is doing it under the effect of, under mystical effect. That is, we cannot do such, uh, such a, uh, we cannot reach such a conclusion. And then, um, I mean, this is something that the church always looks at in great detail when there is something, when there is an issue, and they think that there is, uh, when somebody states that he or she is under mystical influence, either because of apparitions or anything else, the church studies it in a lot of detail, and it employs usually psychiatrists, psychologists, and many other people from the various sciences to see what is, uh, uh, what is really happening over there. Um, and in fact, there are specific guidelines of discernment that are obviously um, issued by the church. Um, so mystical experience, uh, now something else, um, touching a bit on what Gail was mentioning about guilt. It is true that perhaps for too many years, or centuries, the church has focused so much on guilt that perhaps many people have um, conflated the two ideas, the church and guilt, and perhaps have also used the church to their advantage to try and impose guilt on others or try and bring the, the people to do something that they want and claiming that this is being claimed by the church. Um, this means that the church also has to pass through a lot of purification, but also we also have to make a distinction between what is culture and what is related to the church. Um, in fact, I was just thinking uh, sort of, can we relate? Um, I'm seeing that Gail came back, but I'm picking a bit on your points, on the points that you've raised. Um, I was thinking whether we can, um, deal with the three characters of the plot of the play, not in terms only of individuals, but also let's say in terms of the Maltese culture. So if you have, for example, the Agnes representing the traditional Maltese culture, which over the past 10 or 20 years has undergone such a big change, such a very fast change, that uh, it is passing through what I would call like an adolescent rebellion, trying to make do with anything that has to do with religion, and then perhaps reaching erroneous conclusions, while perhaps the mature way would be to try and sift things and to try and see what is really helpful and what is, what is really related to culture, and perhaps it might be time to now um, grow out of, perhaps. I'll stop here for me. Okay, so let me pass back uh, the word to Gail. Sorry about that. I have no idea what happened. Um, anyway, I got cut off. So 
I was actually coming to, to my conclusion. I was telling you about my psychological observations of the play, um, um, where I told, where I said uh, I was talking about Agnes, and I said um, that it, so the play was being taken from from a religious perspective, perhaps because of the setting of the play. However, um, there it, it there was a murder, which we all knew there was, and there was a first a mother who gave birth, which which we knew that was obvious. And then there was a mother who was saying that she doesn't remember giving birth, which had there been no clouding of judgment, you would think, okay, why do you not remember giving birth? As a psychologist, the psychologist in me there said, okay, there's trauma there. There's trauma to do with the birth. So what I'm saying is like, even even the atheist psychiatrist at one point wavered in her in her in her judgment. I'm saying that it, it, it came out a lot, how much it, it can cloud people's judgment. Now, I'm not anti-religion, as in my, my, myself, I'm not a believer at all. However, um, especially as a psychologist, I believe that um, somebody's spirituality is extremely important in their life. And I think that it's very important for us to be spiritual. And of course, religion is part of spirituality. So I'm not anti-religion at all. Um, as stated in one of in one of the questions that um, we, we I, I answered in the run up to the show, I do, however, have a problem with religion being placed or being given um, a remit where where it has not, such as, for example, in in this case where there was a murder, it was a clear murder, and the the mother superior was allowed to interfere far more than she should have been allowed. Um, in the psychiatric evaluation. Naturally, it's a play, it's written for, for, for the benefit of people watching. However, this is what we are discussing today, so I have to mention it. Um, right, um, I, I want to, I have much more to say, naturally, but um, I, and I really want to get into, um, into an in-depth discussion on this. However, I don't want to, lead the discussion one way or another. I don't know whether, Carlo, you've got something to say in response, and then we can. Um, so, so mm -hmm. uh, all right, so Carlo, can have uh, a few minutes to re react to what Gail just said. And then I would like to open up the discussion between everyone. Okay, so um, I agree with you um, a lot about what you said with regards to the Mother Superior and the way in which she used religion um, in order to protect, overprotect perhaps her, um, who turns out to be her niece, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, that is, that is where, I mean, becoming responsible for each other really comes in. I mean, I, I don't she, right? see I don't see anything fundamentally wrong with Mother Superior doing what she thought was best. Because don't mm -hmm. forget, she mm -hmm. is coming from a religious perspective. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. almost all she knows now because she was married. She had two kids. We heard we heard in, in mm -hmm. the play. But this is her life now, and quite frankly, she the, the Agnes was entrusted to her. Mm -hmm. in her life as mother superior of the convent. So I can't blame her for protecting her as mother superior of the convent. What, what I, I would not have done, I mean, apart from the, the, the abuse and, and, and whatever else came, is entrust her into a convent when it was not of her own volition. Yeah, perhaps... <laughs> Well, it, it is much more complicated than that, perhaps, because she might have been in a convent, in a convent that was, well, in that kind of convent, I agree with you. In a convent where she is completely, completely detached from reality and so on. Um, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, she wasn't given the chance to really grow as a person, to flourish. Her, her development was stunted, definitely, definitely. Um, we can okay, see that from, from a psychological perspective, again, we can see that from her lingo, the way she speaks of herself, the way she speaks of... The, in fact, when she was hypnotized, mm -hmm. the lingo in the memories did not change. It did not change into somebody who was 20 years younger or 10 years younger. It remained the same. That is how much her... I mean, that is one of the, the primary symptoms of stunted growth. Right, right. Which we witness a lot of when I work with a lot of trauma patients. Trauma is one of my my expertise. 
Um, and you see that, you see a lot of stunted growth in the way, for example, a 25 or a 30 year old who speak in the lingo of a teenager, for example. And I think we saw that. And I, I, I mean, I, this is why I said it was portrayed so well. I was, so, I was extremely impressed by the actors. Probably, um, exactly. I mean, I don't know whether you would agree with me, but it is probably um, much easier to um, to portray a person who has passed through trauma. Then, I mean, because the church is so at the same time so diverse as well. There are, I mean. In a way, it, I mean, Mother Superior, Mother Superior represents the stereotypical church. And it isn't always possible to pin it really on the, I mean, it is not always a, a precise descriptive of the church perhaps. Can you unmute? Okay. Sorry, I thought I pressed it. I, I said, I said she was not that stereotypical considering that she had been married and had two kids. Right. So it's not the norm for a nun. So right. in essence, we have here, a, okay, mother superior of a convent who's acting as mother superior of a convent, but she also knew the ways of the world. Mm -hmm. What she did not know to her credit is that the child had been abused because that was news mm -hmm. to her. She mm -hmm. learned when we learned that Agnes had been abused. So to her credit. However, I mean, is it, did she choose to see everything through a religious perspective and not get Agnes to a doctor? Or did, did was she just, this is my new normal now. Agnes is in a convent, this is the way we do things, yeah. At a certain point, she says, you have sacrificed what we have sacrificed, what we have sacrificed in faith, we have, ga we have gained in logic. But at the same time, what I mean is, I think that he, she, the author tried to put many things in, in the mother superior, which in fact might perhaps, you, you would need to parse out in many different persons who represent various aspects perhaps of the church as well. But anyway, now we can continue this conversation later perhaps. Just uh, so let this. me open up the floor because of course, yes, if, we can continue, but I, I, it's nice to hear um, some reactions. So, um i think you have the option to raise your hand feel free to do so or just um start talking um i would like to be the first person to to intervene if that's okay chris Obviously, of course I'll, <laughs> i'll be taking it very much also from the play point of view because uh, the issues that both Gail and Carlo have been discussing, which are cardinal um, points, very important points, I'm happy that they brought them to the fore, um, are obviously the issues that we discussed during the rehearsal process, myself with the three actors. Um, in fact, there's Isabel Warrington over here who played to the, the, the part of Mother Superior, so perhaps she'll have something to say from her perspective too. And what's interesting is that even within ourselves as a team, as a, as a cast, uh, we also had highest, uh, we also had uh, different opinions about different things. So uh, some of us are more tilting towards uh, believers, others more towards uh, non-believers. Though that was quite a healthy mixture, which also uh, enriched the process even further. Um, on my end, I, I, I'm a believer, but there were members of the class who had different opinions about that. So even when it came, for example, to Agnes's experience, was it mystical, was it not? Uh, we, we engaged a lot in this sort of discussion uh, and the role that religion has, how, how oppressive religion can be, how much religion can be the cause that at scale uh, earlier on discussed uh, can be uh, the reason that, that uh, stops the growth and the, 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 the psychological uh, well-being of the person. So these are all issues that, that we discussed. So uh, let, let's take the bull by the horns because um, Gail mentioned this at a point in time. What, what happens to Agnes? Interestingly enough, um, we, we remain faithful to the script itself. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the film version, which is written by the same person, by the same playwright, but adapted for the screen and possibly for a more commercial audience as well. Somehow the film, I think, highlights the mystical element a bit stronger than the play does. The play is slightly more grounded. And that is the point I'd like to get to. One of the things that 
I did not agree with the cost in our discussions, and we left it as a disagreement on purpose. So uh, my modus operandi was whenever we discuss one of these philosophical themes, it was like everyone will express his or her opinion. Uh, and our point is not to convince each other. It's ultimately the richer and so the more divergent these opinions, the better. My, my opinion till uh, last Saturday, ironically enough, so this actually shifted, not in the rehearsal process, but after the third performance, I was totally convinced that what Agnes experienced was a mystical experience. I had no doubt of that from my perspective, as even as a director. But the more I engaged with the play and the more I watched the performances, this uh, led me to a change uh, where I realized that what I believe ultimately, because all this is up to interpretation, that the understanding of the playwright's notion of mysticism, um, I, I, we could ask him because he's still alive and I was in correspondence with him, but I, I don't know if I should, but anyway, is that um, what the three characters go through is to identify the illusions that they've had in their life. So obviously Agnes, possibly unconsciously in her case, used religion, as, as Gail was saying, as a way to cope with her trauma, with her abuse. So obviously it was used in a very unhealthy way. Mother Superior went through a whole life of, of failure. She failed as a mother, she failed as a wife, uh, and up to a certain point she's failing now as a Mother Superior because things are getting out of hand. And so she latches onto the voice and onto the illusion of having a saint in her convent to give her some form of hope in life. And up to a certain point, Dr. Livingston as well latches onto psychiatry and onto knowledge to give sense to the failures that she has had in her life, her relationship with her own mother, the death of her sister, and the other uh, disappointments she had. And what the, especially the two main characters go through is this detachment, this groundedness. So by the end of the story, uh, Mother Superior realizes that it's an illusion and she just has to burst the bubble. In fact, there's that very powerful speech at the end where she addresses Dr. Livingston. She thanks her for breaking her illusion, but then she tells her you should have been the one to have died and not your sister. So she hasn't yet reconciled totally. Whereas also the psychiatrist doesn't reconcile totally, but there's this shift in her case towards relying less on knowledge and possibly relying more on faith, giving even the impression that she's actually resorted to the sacraments at the end. In that uh, famous line, you beat an eyelid and do miss it, where she says, I made my confession. So, so basically, what, the way I see it is that there is this importance of groundedness. Uh, so some mysticism, which is all saintly and flying angels and what have you, there's no levitation here, but it's actually coming to, to ground with, with the sometimes even sordid reality of life, which might be uncomfortable to accept, uh, and which is perhaps the only way forward for us to grow. That's my two cents about it. Thank you, Tyrin. Uh, some other reactions from, from the floor. Uh, I have a question. Um, I think uh, uh, I would go to Gail. Um, my question is, um, to what extent, um, well, um, in the play, um, Gail said that uh, religion was her only tool, was Agnes's only tool uh, that she could use to protect herself. Yet, the way I see it, um, I, I think religion was used uh, as a tool to um, oppress her further or punish further. Um, that, well, that, that's my two cents worth, really. In my opinion, um, David, the intention of, of the Mother Superior was not to oppress and punish. I, I, in my, again, from my experience, I think it was her mother's intention, yes, when she, put, when she gave her to, to her sister's care, thinking, you know, let her be locked up in a convent, so to speak. Naturally, this is all imagined because the, the mother is dead by the time we get to the play um, but I don't think that that the mother superior set out to I think that she had a lot of affection for Agnes and and um, I think that they portrayed that extremely well um, in, in the sense that you as an audience develop an affection for Agnes despite the fact that um, there are a lot there were a lot of moments where you get frustrated um, at the situation uh, you can't help but 
feel affection for this innocent victim of, of, of her circumstances. With regards to religion being the only tool, um, um, it wasn't one person's doing. It was the fact that she was first abused and very heavily so, and then entrusted into a convent. And therefore she just did not have the chance to develop anything. She didn't, she never needed anything else. Had she not been raped, um, she would have been fine. She would have had her demons to deal with and she would need psychological help and whatever, but she, she would not have been a murderer, so to speak. The, the murder was a result of the rape, which was a result of her being in the convent, which was a result of her having been abused before. If you know what I, I don't know whether I'm making myself. Um, yes, I don't think I don't think we can blame that bit onto Mother Superior in the sense that I don't think that Mother Superior had much of a choice because no, if she did not accept her in the convent, goodness knows what would have happened to this girl, uh, possibly worse things. I don't know. It's all hypothetical, of course. So no, I, um, I think Mother Superior's blame, if anything, perhaps Izzy can say more about this, is, is the fact that she ironically overprotected her. I'm saying ironically because Mother Superior says that she did not protect her own children. And possibly that's why she overprotects Agnes, yeah. because the fact that she protected her children and it led to her failure as a mother, now is the turn to reverse the situation and to experiment with the other style of parenting, sort of, uh, with still a disastrous result in reality. But but um, I think her intentions were partially good, I would say. I don't know, Izzy, if you have any... I, yes, about. I mean, the way I uh, sort of uh, understood Mother Superior was that she was a person who all her life struggled with, uh, with her own self-esteem. First, she, she, she said she, feels, she felt like a failure as a wife and mother. Um, uh, she said as early as six years old, she, she kind of lost that, that self-esteem in herself. Um, because the, there was a speech where she said that till the age of six, she used to speak to her guardian angel. And then for some reason, at six years old, she stopped listening, she says, and the angel stopped speaking. Now, I don't know what that actually referred to, um, this business of the guardian angel. As she said, it, she, it could have been like, the invisible friend, you know, the invisible playmate that some children have. But it was something that gave her some kind of comfort in whatever way, shape or form, but it gave her some comfort. And from then she actually says, my life was very bleak from the age of six. So something in her life um, uh, made her really have very low self-esteem. Then she got married and had two children. She felt a, a failure in that as well. And once she became a widow, she thought, okay, let me try spirituality. Let me see if spirituality will help me. Um, and even that, and, and in a way, the her overprotection of uh, Agnes was maybe a way that she felt she could make amends with this, uh, with the fact that she felt she was a failure with her own children. Um, so she overprotected her and I believe that she had a lot of affection for Agnes and um, she wanted to help her. She, she didn't want her to go down the same route that her younger sister had gone. Um, so I think I really fe felt that the character of Mother Superior all throughout the journey that she made with the psychologist through the uh, trial with Agnes was um, uh, she was struggling with her own demons, her own lack of of. Uh, um, belief in herself even because I really feel that spirituality for her was her last resort because she kept saying and there was one scene where she kept saying I'm trying to convince even the psychologist but I want to believe in miracles I want to believe in this mysticism I want to have this sort of innocence so to speak in, uh, and belief in, in this faith this unquestioning faith 
Um, and in the end, she lost it when she realized, you know, I mean, this was all, you know, at the end of the day, it was whatever it was, a, a rape or, or even it might have been just an innocent encounter that she had with a field hand, with some kind of a, a person who she crossed paths with. Um, uh, I personally, as, as Isabel and not as Mother Miriam, my take on the play was that Agnes had no uh, mystical revelation or whatever. It had nothing to do with mysticism, but it was just an innocent encounter. She ended up having sex with somebody and she got pregnant. And, you know, there was the shame. She didn't want to talk about it to anybody because she felt this terrible shame that was instilled in her from a child by her mother who abused her. Um, and her mother herself was really psychologically damaged because, uh, you know, I mean, the, the things that she, she did to her. And, and I think that she left her, she left Agnes in the care of her older sister, who was a nun, was because she really, she genuinely thought, okay, I've gone astray and I'm a hopeless case. I'm hoping that in this protected, safe environment, she's going to um, not go down the route that I went and end up, you know, a, a, you know, a very flawed human being. Um, uh, so my take on the whole play is that there, there, were, there was no mysticism. I mean, this was a conversation we had <laughs> during rehearsal. <laughs> I mean, I am a non-believer. Um, I believe in spirituality and it's very important to me, but, but I'm not a religious person. I was baptized and brought up as a Catholic, but I'm not, uh, I don't consider myself a Catholic anymore. Um, and I believe that we should always question our faith. I think it's very important to question um, and to evolve as well because I think that's part of our journey as human beings. Our spiritual journey should question everything, I think. I don't believe in the way I was brought up as a Catholic was, no, you believe, you do not question the faith. Um, the faith is this big mystical thing that you know nothing about. And my take on the Catholic religion, the way I was brought up was that it was there to keep you, um, you know, in darkness so that it could control you in whatever way it, it saw fit. I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but that is my um, experience, obviously, of it. Can I re reply? Yes. Um, so I, I agree with you. That, that's the way I was brought up as well. So I was brought up with the exact same notions. Um, and eventually realized that I did not believe any of it. But yes, that's the way I was brought up in the sense of religion. It's very, I, I'm very interested in two of your perspectives that I, I saw differently. One was um, you saw her, Agnes's mother as putting, as putting her in the care of her aunt as an act of care, whereas I interpreted it as a kind of fobbing off. And, and also in the end, you said maybe it was an innocent um, sexual encounter. And from the reaction that I saw when she was being um, hypnotized, where she was saying, get away from me, get away from me, don't approach me. I interpreted it as rape. I'm not sure whether there is a right and wrong answer. In I, I, my interpretation of when she, she freaked out at the psychiatrist, when she was really grilling her about um, her sexual knowledge, mm -hmm. I, uh, my interpretation was, uh, of that, why she freaked out was because her mother used to burn her but genitals with, with a cigarette. And the psychologist at that point, the psychiatrist had a cigarette mm -hmm. in her hand and she went to embrace no, her or whatever. No, no, no. I, think, I, I think Gail is really fair. Correct me, Gail. To the there second hypnosis, isn't it? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, okay. In act two. Yes, the uh, one there, there, um, basically, okay. mm. um, basically over there, what happened is that 
uh, obviously here a certain amount of artistic interpretation comes into play as well. Uh, the way we saw it was that there was a bit of an interplay between uh, the different realities that she was experiencing, both her memory of what happened on the night and both what was happening in the room there and then. Mm -hmm. So we played a bit with that phrase that you have uh, uh, mentioned, uh, get away from me. Is she referring to, to the man? Is she possibly referring to Mother Superior who was possibly coming in and out of the room to intervene, who was also in a state of panic? Is she referring to Mother Superior there and there in the here and now? We left it ambiguous on purpose. Obviously, the script doesn't really tell you, uh, although the author does give a lot of side notes, but in this case, left it in our hands to interpret. Yeah. That's just to give a bit of background and an answer. I mean, to, to the know. reason why I kind of came to that conclusion was because of her last speech, where she talks about this man who sang to her for six days, and on the seventh day, he came to, to her room, and he lay on top of her. And um, sort of that was, a, a, to me, it's quite plausible that if somebody knows nothing about sex, at all, um, and it's your first experience, she might have actually fancied him, and maybe he did take advantage of her. I, um, if, I suppose it could have been a rape because she was so innocent. It wasn't a violent rape, that, that is my interpretation. It was maybe, co she was coerced into it, and she enjoyed it, and then because of religion, religious perspectives, etc., etc. She felt ashamed and then it led, I mean, she was experiencing these huge changes in her body as, you know, the, pre the pregnancy was, uh, was sort of progressing. And then, you know, birth is a traumatic uh, experience, even in, in normal circumstances when you know what's happening to you. But imagine somebody who is so innocent and she's going through this, enormous experience so i don't know in that second hypnotism I, I to me it was more a case of you know she was really upset at the whole thing that this massive change that happened to her uh physically apart from obviously emotionally and psychologically mm -hmm. uh, so i have a small comment from carlo and then uh Jevin would also like to uh, at his thought. So regarding these last two points, even I thought that it was the result of an innocent sexual encounter and not a rape. Perhaps okay. I'm influenced also by the movie um, and by the play and also by the original script and also because of the repeated reference to it was a mistake. It was a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to make my main point on what Isabel was saying about the, the, the religious um, experience perhaps of Mother Superior, who probably was such on, was on such a, an important spiritual journey, whom she herself probably, she was accepting faith very naively for a certain, for a very long part of her life. Until then she encountered so many problems in her life that that led her to perhaps even lose her faith. In fact, at a certain point she says, I'm, I'm even doubting God. When after she became Mother Superior, she realized that she was the mother of two disgruntled, disgruntled daughters, a, divorce, uh, a widowed mother, and also doubting God. Mm. Um, now that is something that perhaps, and that's why they are all, all three characters are on a spiritual journey, I think. Mm -hmm. And therefore they're all at different stages and Perhaps that's why I think that Dr. Livingston is the one who does the, the greatest move forward in her fate. I was also looking at their names. I don't know whether you can do this as well and give some interpretation to their names. Mother Miriam Root. Miriam is the one who saves Moses. Root is the one in the Old Testament who goes and uh, accompanies her mother-in-law who's widowed for the rest of her life. Wow. Okay. While I don't know whether that, so I was saying, yes, that's what she did. She tried to save her niece while Miriam saved Moses, her brother from the Nile. And she, she, she saved and she went and she accompanied the, the wife of Boaz for the rest of her life, her, her, her wow. aging mother-in-law. How and interesting. 
interesting. Then you also have mother, uh, then you also have Dr. Martha Livingston. Martha, who's the one who first doubts that Jesus can ever raise her brother Lazarus from the dead. But then she tells him, you are my, you are, you are the life, the son of the living God. It is one of the strongest statements of faith in the whole of the gospel. Oh. And then you also have Livingston, <laughs> living stones representing the church. I don't know whether I'm stretching it too much. <laughs> <That? But laughs> the church, I mean, and then finally, obviously, Agnes of God, eh? the, 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 she who That's is offered God, eh? as, the, as the sacrificial lamb. And in fact, Mother Miriam Root mentions that reference as well. She says, why should this person be sacrificed? Or, or, the, or, the, or the psychiatrist say something like that. Why should this person be sacrificed because of her God, something like that. Uh, thank I you, Carlo. Coincidence, you know, no, that, no. those names. I'm sure that the, the playwright um, did his research about that. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, Jevin has been waiting for a while. So... Hi, um, no, it's perfectly fine. Um, I, I hope I have something to contribute to this discussion. Um, I, I can only speak about uh, what I saw yesterday. Um, uh, I haven't seen the movie, I've never read the play or, or the adaptation. Um, so it's basically from, from, uh, from what I saw during the play yesterday and what we've been discussing. And to be fair, I cheated a bit. I, I, I read a bit this morning because I was interested to know more about this, this, whole, this, whole, uh, this whole play. Uh, incidentally, Livingston also happens to be an infamous Victorian explorer who, because of him, most of Africa was exploited. So to go back to the play with words, maybe if it's Livingston with an N, not with an E at the end, it's not Livingstone, but it would be, I think, uh, Henry Morton uh, Stanley had met him somewhere in Africa, and he's one of the, the nowadays vilified a bit explorers was of him, Africa wouldn't have been so much exploited. But anyway, it could be Livingston the Explorer, so to speak. No, uh, Jevin, Jevin, it's interesting because the first line that Mother Superior says is a reference to that. She yeah. comes in, if you remember properly, and she says, Dr. Livingston, I presume, which is exactly ah, okay. yes, what yes, was yes. said to... Stanley, uh, Stanley when he had him. Yes, yes okay, okay. Yeah, that escaped me. Um, I have a few points and maybe a few comments as well to make. Um, uh, to be fair, I don't think religion has anything to do with this play. Um, not the way I'm seeing it. Maybe I'm, I'm being a bit too reactive. I think uh, of God, Agnes of God, is a bit of a red herring. Because uh, thinking a bit about it, to me, it seems to be now, uh, looking back, so to speak, from, from, a, from, 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 a, from, a, from an audience perspective, um, I think we have here society and perhaps it is in, in, in the... In, in, in the and the psychologist, uh, so psychiatrist, and 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 the and the mother, superior who represents the church. Basically, they both represent both parts of society, so to speak. No, the the, the people who decide, the people who are in charge, and they both seem to make, uh, despite their efforts, uh, a whole mess of the situation. So uh, I, I think the focus is is rather than a religious background and and how mysticism etc. can help or undo a person. It's more how uh, the society we live in, at least in the Western world, because religion plays a big part of it. Um, uh, the people who are in charge, or the people who are supposed to take care of, of, of the land, so to speak, or, or the sheep, um, um, do a mess of the whole situation. You know? So uh, on the one hand, uh, Dr. Livingston is trying to fight her demons, the way I see it. So she's, she's drawn into this case, more like from an egoistic perspective, to find herself. Uh, and Mother Superior, who this uh, failed uh, failed mother, failed housewife, uh, if I can say so, um, who's had her own children, she made a whole mess out of it. No, the father is in charge, uh, is, is given charge of, of more of more uh, land, so to speak, in her convent to take care of. So it's already, uh, you, can, you can compare this to politicians as well. You've already messed up uh, elsewhere in your life or in a previous legislature, you know. And all of a sudden, now you're being entrusted with another ministry, with another portfolio, okay? Uh, so I think the fact that it, 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 it happens in a convent is just uh, coincidental. It's part of the setting, really. Uh, the mother superior could have been an, a, an army sergeant, an army colonel, 
somebody who's taking care of, of boarding students, perhaps, you know, um, somebody who's in charge of, 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 of a factory, or, you know, somebody who's, 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 who has people under, under their, their care, so to speak. Maybe factory is not that correct. Um, but somebody who has people under their care. So this person has already failed in life, has been entrusted with taking care of more people, and yet failing, failing once again. That's my take on 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 the on the on the mystical part or the religious part, so to speak. Um, uh, what 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 I also found maybe interesting because we're talking about murder as well here, um, and again not having read 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 the novella or or seen the movie, is it really murder if um, well the, let's let's put it this way Agnes knew that she was killing the baby right, she she put the umbilical cord round round, round its neck. Um, uh, and we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, actually. Maybe if it's a girl, it would have been even... Uh, no, it's a girl, it's a girl. She says, uh, oh, there's one it's reference, but she says so, her and her. Okay, um, I, 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 I don't want to sound misogynist. It, it's not my point here. Um, uh, I, you know, um, so we have these women who are, so to speak, failing. Each generation failing the next generation of girls, of women. You have the, the, mother, who has, the mother who has failed Agnes. Agnes has, has failed her offspring. Uh, the mother, rather than killing Agnes, they had a very hard time in her life. Agnes is trying to actually help this baby by giving it back to God. So, uh, does Agnes do a worse uh, job than her mother? The fact that Agnes has killed the baby not to make it suffer uh, the way she has suffered in life. Uh, is she trying to, so to speak, close off the suffering she has received from her mother, so to speak? Um, so I see a chain reaction happening. So I think in, in the case of Agnes uh, killing the child at the end of the day is her way of reacting of, of so to speak, uh, with the foreknowledge now that, that she, she knows what she has to go through herself and she doesn't want her child to suffer in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it happens to be another daughter. So could this, could this be the case that, that the, way, the, way, the way it develops? Um, uh, I think I think those are the two main folk, uh, the, the two main fault side. The fact that Agnes tries to uh, put her child of, out of her out of its misery, so to speak, for it not to suffer the same way she has suffered at the hands of her mother. For all I know, even her aunt um, maybe came from a, a, a dysfunctional family as well, because they all seem to be to, to have maybe psychological or mental problems. And with I, I, I'm not sure, uh, Tyrion, if if Agnes has a father as well, if it's if he's ever mentioned, so to speak, within the drama. In, um, uh, the Mother Superior says that it could have been anyone from a number of men. So we get this impression that the mother of Agnes was very promiscuous, uh, or at least she had many relationships. Uh, so there's no idea. In fact, the play, the whole idea of the absent male is also another strong thing, which probably we'll be tackling on the so uh, webinar an, okay. on Thursday. Because Okay, so we have an absent male in the case of her father, and an absent male in the absent male in the case of her offspring, so to speak, as well. So it's, in a way, it's, it's, it's history repeating itself. Um, um, yeah, I think I think that is one of the main uh, themes, maybe, that I don't know if has been discussed, but which struck me, and also the fact that um, the, 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 the other two characters represent, in my opinion, society in general. Um, here they are talking about their own problems. Uh, they don't they seem to care about Agnes, but not so much. But it's actually the, the fight, this contrast, so to speak, between the main uh, pillars of society in this case, religion and and or, or rather the, the 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 sacred and the profane. I see it less mystical. I see it more uh, or religious. I see it more of a fact that uh, the, the the institution, so to speak, religion and not the state in this case, but yeah, it could be the state, um, uh, have have let uh, let down uh, let, let down Agnes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jevin. Um, I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, for example, the one that you mentioned, um, how the, the parents or the family situation of the mother superior and her sister probably was also very problematic given that this child from six years old onwards says her life was bleak and probably she got married quite early because her sister wasn't even born yet. And of course, her sister then ran off quite early as well. So it's probably the case that it was not a very happy situation. And interestingly as well, it seems that the convent itself for Agnes wasn't very welcoming. So 
um, we said Agnes relied on religion. If the nuns made her feel welcome, of course, we don't know if this was a reaction from Agnes or if it was true, uh, but she might have had some help through friendship. But she says that the nuns were jealous of her. So mm -hmm. she didn't even uh, feel, feel well with respect to the other nuns. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know if there was the sister Margaret in the background, for example, who eventually called the police and who was aware of what is going on. So Mother Superior and Agnes um, might had this kind of, they were trying to hide this from the rest uh, of the nuns in a way. Uh, but there were these nuns who were maybe curious and trying to uh, discover stuff. Okay, so I know that uh, Robert Falzoni has some comments. Up to you, Robert. Yeah. Uh, just uh, I'm trying to sum up all the thoughts, which is quite difficult, but uh, I don't feel, uh, well, I never felt that uh, we were dealing with a mystical experience here. Uh, so in as much as uh, I don't think that it's a mystical experience, it's not a religious issue. However, the fact that the setting is religious, it, uh, it is not indifferent to the play. I mean, religion surely affected the way that the characters treated the issue. Uh, and I'm saying this because uh, oh, uh, there was a comment earlier uh, about uh, seeing religion as uh, controlling uh, and being raised up that sort of uh, attitude, that sort of mentality. And uh, well, that, was, that was my experience as well. Now, I'm a Salesian priest uh, up till... Uh, my adolescence, my experience was also of religion uh, uh, being uh, very rigid, telling you what to do, what not to do, until I changed my perspective and uh, looked at uh, faith more in terms of a relationship. And I think uh, relationships here are key. Because if we think about it, all three characters have been heavily wounded in their past, in their relationships, and very important relationships. I will have the psychiatrist who at one point talks of her affair with uh, her love affair uh, with um, the French uh, Maurice, if I remember the name correctly and uh, her complicated relationship with uh, uh, her mother and uh, losing her sister. Uh, of course, the mother superior uh, as well. I mean, she's uh, disowned by her own daughters, uh, failed motherhood, and of course, Agnes. So, uh, now, the thing is that, uh, yes, one would ask uh, how do these wounds uh, affect the way that they look at God? And uh, in consequence, how they behave during the, uh, the plot of the play? How does that affect their treating uh, uh, Agnes's story? Uh, and just one last point so that I won't talk again. <laughs> Leave space for others. Uh, I like this uh, uh, dialogue between uh, fate and less fate, let's was it put it that way, believers and non-believers, uh, centering around the story. Because, uh, yeah, looking at fate uh, as a relationship, no relationship is fixed. There is always a story to, uh, there is always a story to relationship. So I think uh, that this is the, uh, uh, it's a brilliant idea to, to uh, center this discussion on a story. Thank you, Robert. Um, so I don't see any hands raised, but... Um, I'm here, uh, Christian, there is Jan, uh, he's physically raising his hand. Okay, Jan, go ahead. So, um... 
what I found very interesting uh, was like, on the one hand, uh, before I go to my general view of the play, uh, was the question about uh, Agnes being uh, guilty or not guilty, like the question whether we can at least call it murder or not. Uh, because there was this question, my answer on this was that uh, there is like a detail which is maybe small but very important to me in this play um, when she describes how she killed the baby I mean uh, she told she to, we know that the baby came into the bin and died inside but she describes how she strangled the baby how she put something around her the th the I don't know the sheet around the throat so the, she the just cord, she, the cord, yeah yeah so she didn't just throw it, it, it into the bin she really wanted to kill it and that's why she strangled it so definitely she didn't just throw it away because she didn't want to have it it means she really wanted to it to die so then this is the first point for me which is very important the second point is that um The, the fact, why did she do it? We talked about the fact, okay, um, she, uh, I think in the play, she said uh, she wasn't worth to have it, which is very important for me. Um, but what I find very, in and but what I find very interesting in general about the character is that I think we, won't ever come to any point of saying is she guilty not guilty because we actually don't come to any conclusions it's the same with the fact when she says the nuns are jealous on me it's a, it's a little bit the same because why did she, does she want to kill the baby why are the nuns jealous she doesn't tell us so she's a, she's like a miss I, th i don't think that we deal with mysticism in this play The only mystical thing is Agnes herself because we will never get any answers. And this is in my uh, opinion because she is in between two very uh, big subjects. And this is on the one hand, uh, of course, the church and on the other side, of course, uh, the um, science, uh, logic things, um, psychiatry. Um, and I think it is not only... Uh, the subject itself, it's not only about religion and um, psychology, but it is about those two subjects, Gansauer. Because we have actually two persons, the mother superior, and we have uh, the psychologist, which are, when we look back to their past, which were just the same persons, but switched roles. The one, the ones, the psychologist's uh, past is described as a religious past, and the mother superior's past is described as a past which doesn't have connection to religion. This is very interesting and very important to me, I think. Uh, so we see twice in the play both subjects Gansauer in the past of both of them and then in the present. But also in present, it doesn't work when they switch roles. So this shows us actually uh, crit the criticism of the author on both of, the, of, on both of the subjects. Because now we have the psychologist who, as I thought when I watched the play, didn't manage to do her job from the first minute. It, was, it doesn't mean, of course, that I think, I mean, it was great played but we could see from the first minute that she doesn't manage to do her job because she doesn't know how to talk to the mother superior without hiding that she really doesn't like her and then we have the mother superior who definitely tells us that it is or what means definitely but who really lets us know that it's not about god for her not in any way in my opinion God is, like you uh, actually, Ms. Warrington said, God and belief is her last resort. But I think if she could take something different, she would also take something different. 
because um, actually she actually it's a little bit selfish what she presents us. She's really she uh, she appears selfish because she just wants peace for herself. Of course, for Agnes too, yeah. But she takes care of Agnes because she needs something in her life that fulfills her. So in the end, this is to me very interesting we sh that we see those two characters uh, described in two, uh, in two uh, steps in, her, in their lives, that they are not getting on with their life and then they switch roles. And then we see that both characters didn't manage with both subjects to live a good life. And this is very important because it shows us and it proves for that both characters tried both. And this is the most important proof to me to show that you, we have to criticize both sides. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Jan. Uh, so I have a comment from Carlo and then uh, we go to Ryan. Okay, so I, I'm, I really enjoyed listening to the, uh, to Jevin, Robert, and Jan, I'd like to um, see some connections between them, in particular um, with regard to the, so Jan, Jevin said, this is not that much about God, but it is more about the institutions of the state and of the church, agreed. However, on another level, I think that the question of God comes in when the question of suffering comes in. And this is something that Robert, I think, referred to indirectly when he was mentioning the woundedness, that all three characters are wounded. Um, and I think, and in fact, this is so, I mean, we, believers start questioning their faith many times when they encounter the mystery of suffering in life. And non-believers many times as well start dealing with the question of God when they encounter suffering or for example, the death of a loved one. There are these changes in life perhaps that sometimes can bring us to really dialogue or, or they're sort of, they bring us to have points of contact between believers and non-believers. And perhaps this is perhaps the most important point um, related to faith in my opinion. Um, between these three characters, the fact that they all encounter suffering in some way or another, and that is where the, the, the question of God is challenged, either on one side or on the other. Yes, in fact, uh, Carlo, this is one of the reasons why we chose this play, because at the end of the day, this is, these are all central uh, human experiences. And at the end of the day, believing or not believing, we have to deal with, the ex with our existence. And uh, a lot of questions come up uh, and we have to sort of uh, decide how to live at the end of the day. Okay, so uh, Ryan. Hey, thanks. Um, thanks for the whole production. So I, I really enjoyed it. Just a few points. I'll try not to repeat myself. Um, three main, main things that kind of stuck from this discussion for me. The first one is kind of a personal journey as well as in a personal agenda for me. Um, we, spoke, we spoke a bit of, about the sexual encounter, whatever you want to call it, although that's the problem for me that, that Agnes had. So considering in any way consensual a relationship with someone that didn't have even the notion of what is consensual, and not calling it rape for me is a disservice in its own. So whether she was open or not, but the lack of knowledge and the lack of life experience and the lack of everything except what she had, which had what zero knowledge on the subject, um, I, I can never consider that non-rape, let's put it this way. Um, uh, from my point of view, it's, it's, it's impossible. I, I struggle to even just consider it that way because of, you know, that there was zero knowledge in Agnes about it. So that's a side note, but it kind of kept with me and I wanted to, to kind of clear. Before we mention the point, and I think this, this was very interesting um, about, it was mentioned mostly about Mother Superior, but I think it can be extended, which is the, the idea that she was doing everything from a, a place of good. 
So the starting point was I want to do good. And pun intended maybe, but you know, sometimes we say the quote, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think this metaphor of, of wanting to do good, which is fine, but does it give permission that in order to do good, we kind of sometimes overstep what is ours and what should be referred to other people? And unfortunately, I think this is this is something that I've seen and I and, and I've discussed throughout my experience as well, um, um, both in my work and and in, in my, my my previous engagements in life. That sometimes with with this notion of good intention, we kind of give our ourselves permission to be okay with just knowing a bit, and we'll see how it goes. And I think that's very dangerous. And it's very dangerous, it's even more dangerous when we're looking at a platform in our society where we're moving towards professionalism in every aspect of life. And not even professionalism, but specialized professionalism nowadays. So having even the word of volunteer work, for example, the specialization of people that are specialized and properly trained to deal with certain things, then sometimes I feel it's a bit symptomatic in, and, and uh, in church institutions, but I don't want to highlight church institutions just because it's a topic, but in some institutions in general, that amateurism is kind of okay because we're doing it with a good heart. I think that's very dangerous. Um, uh, this is my belief, obviously, um, but I think it's something that is very, very dangerous. Having said that, so I don't just knot it with the, with the church. Um, uh, a big problem throughout, and I think the most clear cases were Mother Superior and the psychiatrist, were the unmatchment of roles. So all of them had layers of roles with no distinction whatsoever. So you had the primary caregiver, but also the Mother Superior, but also the, the, the faith companion, all in one person, dealing with a sensitive situation of a vulnerable person, with, with, a, with a potentially criminal situation. On the other hand, a psychiatrist with the past experiences that clearly were undealt with. So I think that's something that the psychiatrist and people working health professionals, as we know, we, we need to, to, be, to keep on going with therapy and, and also try, try to as much as possible bracket our own things and not unmesh them in what we're working with. So all this enmeshment um, uh, is what is, probably make me, making me struggle to say whether this was something related to religion or not. Because everything was so enmeshed. People had so many hats at the same time. Okay, it was three roads. So the three roads were very loaded. Um, and it was very difficult to determine, you know, for example, the psychiatrist creating boundaries. Uh, I think, I don't know if I mentioned it just, just now. I think it was Jan, I'm not sure. Um, this, this idea that the psychiatrist from, from the beginning couldn't make the boundary of the profession that I'm working with my patient. She just couldn't. And you just, you know, this personal kind of um, competition with the psychiatrist left her, for example, as part of the hypnosis, you can stay if you want. Again, boundary. So there was a whole enmeshment issue which, which I think um, uh, created this wanted confusion, as in this, this, this multiplicity of roles, this, this, this number of heads going on and off, which, which created more this, this kind of, what you would say, one such a model called bias, and it's, it's, it's too much and meshed together. To tie, in with that's what to tie in with what you've said, Ryan, there are two very short sentences in the play, which are said by the two respective characters that really summarize this. And they're both set towards the end in that state of commotion that happens in the hypnosis. The psychiatrist tells uh, Mother Superior, she belongs to me. So you're seeing this girl in this really bad situation. And what the psychiatrist is interested in is that she belongs to me. Whereas Mother Superior shortly afterwards tells her, don't do this to me. So once again, this meanness, which, uh, which ties in with the enmeshment that you've been talking about yeah. Mm -hmm. um, shows how wounded, in fact, both of them are. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Gail, I, I was seeing you nodding. I don't know if you want to add something to this. I'm really pleased to be hearing th these discussions. I think there's such valid contributions. Each and every one of you like had something really valid to say. Um, with regards to, I, I, I unfortunately didn't take notes. I was, but uh, with regards to, to, to Ryan, the, the last speaker, definitely there's a huge enmeshment from the get go. Um, there's there's a breach of boundaries from the very start, uh, um, where Mother Superior insists on uh, being spoken to rather than the, the the patient at first, and of course there's there's a bit of a, a battle of of of, of wits there, and then she kind of she still entertains her. Pero as a as a therapist, I would say, listen, can, do you mind leaving the room and bringing my patient in at that point, you know? But she entertained it, and and it grew. This this. This this enmeshment grew as 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 um, now naturally again it's for the benefit of of the viewers but it it's so palpable um, I agree I also love the comparison between it being a normal situation as in the situation I believe it was Jan who made it um, who said it's it's just like the real world it's just a, a battle between religion and, and science like two powers and there's a situation in between and everyone's interpreting it from their own perspective and everyone's missing the wood for the trees. Um, which was a very interesting take, in my opinion. Uh, there was something else I, I, I heard and I thought, how interesting. Ah, yes, the, the, um, somebody said, I, what was she doing? I think it was Jevon um, who said, was she doing a disservice to the, to the baby or was she doing it out of, was she actually breaking the intergenerational trauma? We can see that, that this child, she knew there was no way she was going to be able to raise it. That we, we saw she was not raised well at all. Her mother, by the fact that she was an abusive person and her own sister as well, age six, lost her spirituality, which is a very young age at which to lose your spirituality. We are led to believe that there was something happening in that household as well for, for both the children, both the, the daughters, the mother superior and her sister to have ended up the way they ended up. Um, so th there's a huge case for intergenerational trauma. I don't think it was it, it, it was sexist at all of you to say. I mean, we are faced with an all woman cast, and I think it's deliberately um, that that the intergenerational trauma is from female to female here, although it, it is exceptionally common. You're right. Did you break the, the 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 chain of the trauma there? She actually broke the chain of of the of of. of uh, propagation of the species she actually stopped she, she killed the child they can no longer have any more children um, so uh, with regards to it I, I agree fully with ryan as in even even if it even even if it was consensual sex it was definitely rape i don't think that agnes was in any position to consent to sexual relations with anybody um, um i can't remember what else i had i i, I had some very interesting um comments so thank you Thank you, Gail. So I think it's Alex's turn now. Hello. It's, it's okay. Okay. Um, Yena Pala Spettatur, um, Ojbitnu Latitni Hafnal play. Um, right on Kalla, Li Kellom issues, Kipt in Samakul Hatiaf, Kine Minazer, Religion, Yaw Allah, Ukine Mina Bandana, Vishikov Yamadan issues. Però li bdejt u tejdu l-ewwel jekkin xi kun aħjar għal Agnes li ma tidħolx fil-konvent ma naħseb kważi relevanti għax qisha rajta traġik fi garb l-ewwel li. U li kieku ma daħlix il-konvent naħseb kienet jew issir xi abuser bħalomma għalix ma rajt insomma fl-ambjent li kienet tejx li di kienet set fit tejxi għajnuna. Il-psychiatris daħlet taħti l-lorni tal-qorti għax kiko għat ma kienet fitġa. Li ija kwazi il-realta tal-ħajja ta' ħafna. Li kienem li għarrajin li they were wearing so many hats. Naħsa fija realta u koll ta' nies li kunu fil-management xi kull tant trit t-kopja f-affarijiet li uma tekniċi u affarijiet uħra li t-diglia ma l-persuna n-nifisa speċalment jak kitkun taħdem xie kumpanija zajra illi ma ndak xie l-lussu li kollok xie HR gbir etc 
u fil-fatt kien hemm xi ħadd ieħor li seba' lidi qisha naħseb ġebel xi ħaġa tas-soċjetà mhux biss ta' reliġjon bil-play. Li rajt illi din Agnes ġiet irrajpjata darbtejn darba minn xi ħadd u Agnes isa irrifjutat il-fatti u darba uħra mill-psychiatrist jew therapist fl-aħħar iġifieri fejn biex ngħidek fetħiet ila orizzonti jew moħħa u xi kudin din witit sakemm u mbagħad qatt lek lila nfisha. Rigward Agnes ħassejt li vera li i kienet temmen li laħqet ċertu mistiġizmu f'ħajjitha, anke għall-fatt li rridet tgħix blost jabiss u il-mother jien fil-play ħassejta li ma kienitx oppressive u qabel ma bort nara din play, ħseb li ħaj kun hemm din l-idea ta' oppressive church li bdejt tussemmu, pero ma ħarġitx mill-play, pjuttost kienet il-mader ħarġet qisa omm. Fil-fatt meta bdiet she was enforcing her own opinion, whatever, biex issalba il-dillegnis biex tijikon u biex to get real speċi. Li rajt dil-play kienet il-li egnis kienet eda ximot tigber pala flaspet spirituali malu aġol konvent sakem il-ħazen jew evil was from the outside. Meta evil as rape came from the inside, everything broke down. And it broke all the three persons involved. Li tfakkarni fil-film The Village jisu fuq li stessa spet mexa. Dinu għal rajta li xikultant il-knis, mux xikultant, il-knis għadbati bieħ illi tinfurzana pċertu ideologi li flopinuti u matajbi biex nikbru. Pero meta evil speċi is from within, it is at a loss. Thank you, Alex, for your Thank comments. You. Um, I don't know if there are any other reactions. There are some, some voices which we haven't heard yet. <laughs> I have a question if I could. Of course. Um, we all, we all, we, none of us spoke or we, kind of miss the whole uh, issue regarding the stigmata. I don't know, maybe your self Christian or Thailand have uh, uh, anything to say about it, because I think the, the scope of the stigmata at the end is to uh, give a, 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 so to speak, a, 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 leave us with a bigger question mark. I don't know if you have anything to, you know, to say mm -hmm. about that, because I think mm -hmm. I'd be interested to hear that. There's other point as well. Um, again, maybe I'm wondering now. Uh, my mind is 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 is, um, is, is on a, is on a roll. Um, the, this whole affair reminds me a little bit about the whole affair, albeit the other way around, with Santa Maria Goretti. Uh, this uh, this very simple girl, beginning of 20th century, was actually stabbed rather than give in to to this this young guy a little years older than her who wanted to have sex with her and she obviously because of religion uh, continued to, 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 to deny him and eventually he killed her. This is, again, maybe I'm seeing too much into, into the whole, into the whole uh, background to the story. It gives me uh, the idea as well it's a bit the, the reversal over here what's happening. Um, I'm, I'm seeing Tyrion as well nodding. <laughs> maybe you, you can enlighten me a bit about this, this fact, I don't know. So let's um, start with this. Okay, go, go, sorry, go, sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Okay, um, so just a comment about this uh, thing. 
uh, I think the the play writer uh, just put in every argument, every kind of miracle that have been uh, identified by the church. He put it there, sort of like um, there is this of the stigmata, um, the virgin birth. It's there. Um, there is also a very interesting. Um, th there is a small discussion about the word begot. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's it's kind of out of context when it comes. So. But it reminded me of uh, the case of Bernadette. So Bernadette, the church um, approved her her sightings as uh, true because she came up with a word that she didn't know, which was the Immaculate Conception, today's uh, feast, actually. And the church really used that argument, saying that this girl couldn't have come up with this word, so it must be the Virgin Mary. So anything that has been used in history to, to uh, in favor of uh, an argument in favor of God is thrown in the play. And it, it seems kind of to, to tell us, if you want to believe, you can have find any excuse to believe. If you don't want to believe, nothing will convince you. Uh, and that's, that's very interesting. And also, the, what is a miracle? It comes also out in the play. So at least when I used to teach uh, in Museo many years ago, uh, we used to say that a miracle is something that science cannot explain. And I remember like being taught that um, there were the church used to go to a scientist, for example, or a doctor, for example, in, at Lourdes, when there are people getting um, uh, getting better from their from their sickness, and the, the the medical doctor or the scientist would say, "Okay, this is uh, I can't explain it, um, so probably it's it's a it's a miracle by your definition." But of course, it's interesting that the more science advances, the, the, the domain of what is a miracle by this definition will shrink. So uh, there is also this idea of what a miracle is or is not, or whether it is even possible, sort of, whether it goes against the, the laws of nature, which I don't think it does. So yeah. up to you, Tyrin. Uh, no, no, basically, I'm very much in line with what Chris said. Um, so the stigmata, besides obviously the theatrical and aesthetic value of it, we won't go into how long it took us to figure out how that effect was going to be done on stage. Uh, many trials and there is something easy smiling over there. Um, but apart from that, I think it's uh, exactly what Chris is saying, that on one hand, you can say, oh, she's bleeding blood. So it must be mystical. It must be an intervention of the divine. But on the other hand, and I'm sure that Gail can obviously back us up with a lot of uh, theoretical framework over here, it can be self-induced. So, so many things can be self-induced. Um, and although we do not have any scientific uh, straight-jacketed answers to it, on the other hand, as was mentioned in the place itself, through hysteria, through, through self-inducement, these things could happen. So, so basically, for every argument that there is in the play being proposed that could tilt towards a supernatural intervention, there is the counter argument. I think what the play is all about, as, as I was mentioning before, is this invitation to be more grounded and to, to deconstruct certain illusions or certain um, strongholds that one can have uh, that uh, deviate a person from, 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 from being grounded. Regarding Santa Maria Goretti, I must admit that as a figure, I was never too, too enthusiastic about her. Possibly she's always been presented as this very trivialized character that, that, that I could never really relate to. So, so over there, Jeff, and I'm afraid I don't really have much to, co to comment. Uh, I do hope that our Agnes was portrayed in a deeper way. And unfortunately, sometimes Maria Goretti tends to be portrayed. Uh, I'm sure there's a much deeper story to that as well. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes uh, going back to my childhood, she was uh, portrayed as this girl who was almost like a superwoman, sort of a super girl, sort of. Um, so I cannot say I can really see that association there. Okay, so I have a comment from Jan at this point. Yes, concerning the uh, miracles uh, of church with the... Um with the virgin birth and the stigmata and all this. Actually, um, 
the combination of all of the different miracles to me appeared like yeah some like something that made the whole investigation even more ridiculous uh, or not the investigation but the belief that it could be something supernatural because um so first the fact that uh, the mother superior belief and ever believed in the fact uh, or not believed that uh, let me start again first the fact that we had stigmata and now we and actually we're talking right now about stigmata that nobody has ever seen except agnes because they were covered uh, in the play and the mother superior also didn't bring her to hospital so probably she never saw the wound um, and here we are talking about a, a miracle that uh, was experienced by Jesus the next miracle is a miracle that was experienced by Maria so we are talking about two completely different persons of the Bible and suddenly they are combined within a, a small girl which is to me like a very ridiculous thing and very like almost overdriven like it's too much it's exaggerated and that showed to me that was ac actually to me the answer of all these miracles it is a a very exact it, it it shows the exaggerated way of explaining uh, the how uh, the how, how Agnes could be innocent it's it shows an exaggeration actually to me mm -hmm. um, can I add something here this is what I was trying to portray in the beginning um, in, 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 in my opening where I said I, I was getting increasingly frustrated because it was taking a religious turn where it was very obvious that there was a murder and we should be investigating a murder. Like, why are we talking of mysticism? So I agree completely. It was the setting, I think, that, that um, first of all, they started, I don't know whether anyone mentioned it because my, my daughter needed a lot of attention there, but um, I don't, it, there was the fact that she was singing with a beautiful voice and they, Mother Superior was convinced that it was the voice of somebody else that it was some mystical experience, that it was somebody taking over her body. Um, there's the stigmata, there's... So I think it's the setting that's alluded to, to, to the religion and to um, everybody getting caught up in this mist cloud of mysticism. Um, had it happened in any other setting, I don't think there would have been, been any thought of, of mysticism. So I'm seeing there are some people... Okay, Robert, go ahead. Oh, I'm just thinking, uh, I'm going in a different direction from what's been said right now, but uh, um, at one point came to my mind the, the, uh, that, in fact, uh, there was another baby in the, uh, in the plot. At one point, uh, and Dr. Livingston, when she's talking about her past, says that she has become pregnant at one point. Then we don't know what happens to the baby. She she stops as as if she she's blocking uh, blocking her uh, her her monologue. Uh, so we, we don't really know, but it, it must have been quite difficult for her. But she she doesn't find the words how to continue to say what had happened. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, whether this uh, when at the towards the end of the play, then she. Uh, discovers that in fact uh, it was not uh, uh, the baby had not been murdered by someone else because it, it, it somehow leads us to, to understand that uh, uh, the psychiatrist had been thinking that uh, someone else came in and murdered the baby some uh, even the gestures uh, you know, this must have been uh, the choice of the production uh, but the gestures of the actors, uh, at, the, the, the looks that uh, the psychiatrist gave uh, the mother superior at one point, as if trying to look if there are any reactions uh, to what uh, uh, the hypnosis was bringing up. Uh, I felt when, when I was watching the play that uh, uh, it came as a surprise uh, that in fact it was uh, uh, Agnes herself who killed the baby and not uh, some other nun or someone else who came in and killed the baby. And I don't know if, the, if that has to do somehow with uh, 
her final uh, her final comment about uh, being touched and uh, that being a miracle sort of somehow dr livingston is questioning the fate i don't know that that, that sort of uh, connection is being made you know, her own life story somehow losing a child we don't know if it's deliberate or not or what has happened and seeing that uh, this uh, uh, this novice agnes kills her child whether on purpose or not that's what we were talking about but mm -hmm. Yes, in fact, I, I assume that it was probably an abortion that, that took place there. Um, but and we're not also sure that, of it. Yes, and also the dream that she had, mm. uh, where the, a small baby like was pulling her inside a, a woman's womb. It was also very telling there. Um, so it seems that she's still grappling probably with some guilt. And then she says, what I, what I could have done with a baby then she was like continued thinking um yes that was a very interesting part as well okay we have so we have time for maybe one or two other interventions and then we start uh, concluding unless the, there is someone else. Um, so I suggest that we conclude as like the same way we started by giving word to Carlo and Gail. And um, so it's up to you, we have like a few minutes left. Okay, so what saved it me from this conversation was uh, this word grounded, something that um, Tyron mentioned but then also, I mean, you're all coming from very practical points of views and work. I mean, Gail from her work as a psychologist and uh, all of you, you were all speaking from your own personal experience. So I was also struck a lot from what, uh, by what Tyron, by what Ryan mentioned, rape. Um, yeah, the, the definition of rape, perhaps we're still too much, you reminded me and you're very right that we're too much um, bound to a very narrow definition of rape. But as you're saying, uh, when it's, uh, even though it might seem as though it is consensual in this case, definitely um, one can define it as rape. And um, what you mentioned as well about voluntary work. Um, to me, it's something that always come, keeps coming back to me whenever we're, we're, whenever we're discussing all this is that it isn't simply about the question of the existence of God or um, the mystical aspect, but it, it goes much more than this. It is about how we deal with life in general and the, the church as well. The church is also as an institution. I think um, that is something I, was, I, was, I found myself thinking a lot about the church as an institution, how many times either the church or everyone. Sometimes we use God to fill in the gaps, which can sometimes lead us to erroneous answers instead of really looking, trying to deepen our relationship with God and uh, creating a community which can help ourselves and others grow from our wounds. That's it, basically. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, what, what, what I took, first of all, thank you all for your contributions once again. It's been a very, very interesting um, um, com debate. Um, but what, what, what I uh, um, took from all this is we're all, we all see things from our own perspective. And um, it's okay to do so. It's just not okay to put your perspective onto others, so to speak. And in terms of of uh, the religious versus non-religious aspect, which a little bit not religious. <laughs> Most of us, the ones who are not religious are not religious at all. Um, but the, it, the, from the religious non-religious aspect, um, uh, I, I, like I said earlier, I feel that religion has a very important part in society. Um, I just think that it can be dangerous if, if, if given responsibilities that are not within its remit. 
per esempio, uh, for example, as, as happened here with this mother superior, doing good is not enough for you to want to be involved in a criminal investigation. Wanting to protect somebody is not enough that in, in, in wanting to be um, to hinder a psychiatric evaluation. Doing good was not enough for you not to call a doctor to protect her or to send her for psychological. And, and this is, she was acting out of her remit there. And I feel that in society, this happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, for example, um, uh, I had one particular client that I can think of, but she wasn't the first, and I'm pretty sure she's not going to be the last, whose, um, uh, whose partner, husband, actually, um, uh, beat her in front of her parents, who are deeply religious, who brought the, the, the parish priest, who told her not to leave her husband because she's breaking the marriage. And obviously she, she ended up, she listened at first and then she ended up much worse and then she ended up in, in, in therapy, in, in clinics and as, at a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And it's not, it's not okay for a, a priest, for example, to give marriage advice on, on, based on that. You can say, look, our religion says this, our religion says that. But come on, a woman's safety. I mean, if, I mean, her own parents you feel were at fault first and foremost. But also, I would have expected at least a priest, somebody who's a learned scholar, to turn around and say, "Look, you know, she's in danger. She's let her leave." No, he, he actually intervened and convinced her to stay. So it can be extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. This is like me giving religious advice. <laughs> I'm not my crippling so at all, and I won't. Okay. Uh, there's, there's, I believe there's a question. Um, Chris, do you wanna? Um, but uh, Ryan, you want to add to, to say something? Sorry, just on top of what he was saying about um, uh, DV or domestic violence, I've seen I work with a different uh, client base. Kind of my work is in therapy as well, um, uh, and when it comes to gender and sexuality issues, for example. We've seen a lot of improvement, so I don't want to be negative. We've seen a lot of imp improvement, openness, um, ability to refer. So let's call a spade a spade, and we're seeing there are many uh, people that are right. collaborating. Having said that, uh, we've collected a lot of pieces as well as we go as we went along, and we're still collecting pieces from I would call them non-informed advice. Let's put it this way: non-informed advice. Um, so again, it's, it's a matter of good intentions, but when not informed thoroughly, it can create a lot of pain and damage, which is longer lasting, because then even working with the family will become more complicated. So I just wanted to add up on what Gay was saying quickly. Yes, mm -hmm. and by no means am I saying that this is just something that religion does. Tajafiri, a lot of different professionals intervene, intervene in other people's but we are talking about religion and, and I do know that there are at least two priests among us so it would be worth bringing it up um, uh, it, it, it's okay to speak from the perspective of, the, of your religion of course but not okay to go into the remits of other people because it could cause a lot of harm I mean we don't go into remits between one branch of psychology and another from like into psychiatry or psychology as a priest, for example, and I don't blame them. I mean, this come, even in my lifetime, the priest was the go-to person for everything when I was a kid. So I, I, I don't blame people who are hard pressed to, um, and who are, whose brains are hardwired to think this way, but perhaps it's time to start educating the people and the clergy um, towards this end. Mm -hmm. you are, I mean, if I may, I mean, that's why I mentioned the, um, the institution and also culture. Sometimes there's so much enmeshed into each other that as you're right, we, we tend to make a mistake. And the thing is when we do not teach people to, um, to deal with, with the church in, in a healthy way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian, you want to add something? Uh, yes, first, thank you very much for uh, the, the views of you. Um, I would be interested uh, 
to get to know a little bit more of reflection uh, of the scientific part because we had right now a lot about the church but i would also be interested about um the reflection of the yeah scientific part which was also presented as let's say improvable <laughs> Um, by by scientific part, Jan, um, do you mean the, 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 the psychological part? Yes, I mean the psychological part, yeah. Were you here in the beginning, in my opening, or did you come after that? Uh, actually, yeah, so then maybe I missed uh, something yeah. because I... So what I observed myself, I, I, I see everything as a therapist, right? It's, it's the hardest mm -hmm. path for me to take off. Yeah. I try, I do, but it's very hard for me to take off that. So, um, um, so when I was watching the, the, the play, what, what came to me was the deep-seated trauma, the deep-seated intergenerational trauma, okay? So we've got a child who was sexually and psychologically abused by her mother, who was already promiscuous and became an abuser, whose sister was somehow lost her spirituality age six and then turned out to be a failed wife and mother to two people and then went into the convent and became mother superior and then failed the people inside the convent as well so there was a lot of deep-seated intergenerational trauma and the the, the basis of the, the psychological basis was that um uh, there was a lot of enmeshment, um, as Ryan very rightly pointed out, in the sense of we had the psychiatrist who was acting as a, care, a carer at some point. At some, I think at some point she actually said, um, she's mine. Um, and, and there was Mother Superior who was fluctuating between being an aunt, a mother, a Mother Superior, someone who's trying to get to the truth. There was a lot of, of enmeshment of roles. Um, there, there was a huge um, uh, break of boundaries from the get-go, as in Mother Superior first insisted that she be interrogated as of the patient. So the psychiatric evaluation was of the patient, but Mother Superior is like, no, no, speak to me, I know what happened. She doesn't know what happened, which was, um, and the psychiatrist at first was like flustered, but then kept entertaining her. She didn't tell her to leave the room, but well, she did, but the, the, the Mother Superior remained there till the very end. So she was actually dead during the hypnosis. So there was a, there was a huge enmeshment of boundaries there um, um, from a psychological perspective as well. The child was not given any tools, Agnes being the child, was not given any tools to deal with the, with the world. At one point we are told she was sheltered and the only place she ventured eventually was to the convent. So she went from, her, from an abusive home into a convent. So she had nothing, no, no tools, but the religion which she found in the convent with which to deal with her trauma. And of course, so therefore she saw it through the eyes of religion where there was none to be seen, where it was, it was the wrong lens, but it was the only lens she had. So there was that, there was a, a lack of, of tools with which to deal with the trauma, with any trauma really, with life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course, um, there was an accumulation of trauma because at one point we said she was, she was inept, she, she, she ended up murdering as a matter of fact, but it was an accumulation. It was one thing leading to another. I, mm. in, in, it, it gives me the sense, although I could be wrong, that had there been a break at any point in that chain from her abuse to her murdering her child, the murder would not have happened. You know, and we, we see this a lot in, in trauma. We can identify literally the points which could have, at which it could have been um, uh, avoided. Right. I don't know whether I've answered your question. Um, yeah, my uh, question would now uh, especially be um, because uh, we also talked a lot about the, let's say, about the borders of uh, religious belief and where, uh, where are the problems right now in our society. So, um, so my question was that whether you also saw some borders of your uh, profession uh, or that uh, were reached in this play in the but uh, and whether you can put it on a more general uh, on a more like general view so if you um, 
do you see anything to improve in your profession in society like we uh, saw it now concerning religion do you understand what i mean i, I i'm not sure i hope i hope i do if i don't um, yes uh, we're, we're running out of time so oh, okay just uh, we just have a quick time just one minute maybe from gail and we'll have to conclude Okay, I, I'm not sure whether I understood your question correctly. Um, whether there's anything that that can be improved in my profession in relation to religion and religion. No, uh, to, in general, in, not in relation to religion, but in relation to society, because we saw that uh, problems of re religion, religious belief, and we said this is uh, we and we said okay, concerning um, religion. This is very problematic in our society now if we talk about religion. Um, and those problems were shown very clearly in the play. But we also have the other side in the play. We have the side of the psychologist, which was okay. like- He's a psychiatrist. And, yeah, and psychiatrist, yeah. Um, uh, yes, um, okay. From, yes, I, I, I see what you mean now. Um, in a nutshell, I, I think this is very important um, and I, I don't know anybody who doesn't do it, but it's very important to point it out. Mm -hmm. We do not bring our own beliefs into the session. So, for example, I, I use my clients' spirituality, religious belief, and whatever is important to them in a therapeutic manner for them. It's, it's irrelevant what I believe. What I care about is what, my client, what it means to my client. If my client comes to me and says, I'm seeing an apparition, I, I'm not there to say it happened or it did not. I'm there to assess what this apparition means, what my client is getting out of it, and then um, assess whether or not there is the, the potential for it to be um, something else, such as, for example, um, schizophrenia, for example, and then I would send her to be assessed for schizophrenia. But my first reaction is not, I'm atheist, you're definitely not seeing anything religious, yeah. to ship you off to a psychiatrist, cool. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I don't know if Tyrin wants to say something at this point. Um, no, not much in the sense of, I think it was a very beautiful opportunity for all of us to be here and to express our views. I really agree with what Gail said last, the importance of uh, expressing one's perspectives without imposing them, but at the same time knowing one's boundaries. I think that's what it boils down to, that one knows what his or her remit is, especially in the professional life. And because whenever one does not respect boundaries, it always leads to the damage of, of the person that one is working with. I really um, think that what Gail mentioned and other people mentioned is really important. But I think this is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, if there were more of them where people can get together and express in such a healthy way, even divergent opinions. I think it's, it's a beautiful moment that we have shared together. Yes, uh, in fact, I would like to add to what Tyreen is saying that um, I we would have liked to involve many other people, but um, unfortunately, we found that sometimes um, some people would feel be afraid to join such a discussion just because there are people of the other end of the spectrum, and we, we've heard this actually directly to, said to us. Um, thankfully, we were sort of brave enough to um, come here share our views. We did it very respectfully. We knew our borders, like we were saying here. And I think everyone like this, everyone can learn and can grow um, and learn at the end of the day, um, how to deal further like with this uh, mystery that, that we live in, that is our life. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a big pleasure. Uh, those of you who want to join us will have another webinar on Thursday. This time we'll be focusing more on femininity issues re regarding the church and, and the history um, and how this all this shows in, in Agnes of God. Okay, so thanks once again thanks. and have a nice evening. Bye, good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.